So my name is Bob Schwartz. Some of you may know me, some of you may not. If you've uh, been to past Magento events or past Imagino events, you may know me as the ex-president here. And imagine being my baby. <laughs> and I'm very proud of what we have built here and uh, this event. If you know me, you love, uh, you know I love building great companies and brands. That's what I'm focused on. And uh, I did it with Magento. I've done it a couple times before. And uh, today I have a, an organization that focuses in on doing multiples, right? Multiple companies at once. But it's all, it's all based around the change, the massive changes going on in retail. In other words, commerce, right? Huge changes. And one of the things that we um, like to say is it's really not about online and it's not about offline, but it's really about the weaponization of retail. It's how do you take these great products and tools that we've built over the last decade and a half and leverage them just for better experiences. How do we put those kind of weapons and tools into the hands of merchants, right? So one of the things that occurred to me is products are proliferating, locations of products are proliferating. You know have DCs. If you don't have one, you might have multiple distribution centers, right? You have drop, you have drop ship partners out there around the world and sometimes around the United States. You also have uh, your own pick, pack, and ship centers. You have partners. You have retail stores and multiple retail locations. So product is proliferating. At the same time, modes of transportation and modes of shipping is proliferating. You have all the things we know. You now have an audience out there, a global audience, that wants to go, why can't I get it internationally? You have transport carriers. You have same-day carriers. You have all this demand. It's getting more and more complex. Uh, one of the reasons why I decided to uh, partner up and help Carl with Tomando as one of our portfolio companies is he's going after solving this problem, and I saw it as a giant problem. I talk to retailers every day. And what, in essence, they're going to talk about today is putting those kind of weapons in the hands of a merchant. So today, with all that proliferation, all that headache, as a merchant, all we've ever thought about is how do I squeeze an extra penny out of FedEx? How do I beat the crap out of UPS and get an extra nickel? It's a cost center for us. And what they're going to talk about today is ways that they've been able to uh, put weapons on top, allowing merchants to now look at, uh, to take into consideration margin, product location, everything to create one of two things, more cost-effective movement of product or higher levels of service uh, for their customers. And with that, uh, you're going to be hearing from both uh, Gary Wheelhouse of Harvey Norman and Carl Hartman of Tomando. So take it away, Carl. Indeed, the reason I created Tomando was to solve this problem. Um, I started my career not unlike Gary. Um, university, I was working in a consumer electronics store, and I was commissioned. And what you, this is back when plasma TVs used to cost $10,000. And sometimes we only had $100 in profit on the TV. And mark my words, uh, consumer electronics margins are still thin. And what I quickly learned was the cost of shipping basically determined whether we made any profit or not. And I went, the retailer I work, went, uh, worked for went from having six stores to several hundred over a period of five years. An IPO was a very exciting and a great place to, to learn all about retail. But mark my words, we lost money about eight out of ten times we tried to deliver it from a store because we got told, do a flat rate, it'll average out, law of averages. Uh, law of averages didn't actually because we had people coming from all across the region to try and, uh, and say, hey, your, your price is so cheap, you know, how much will it cost to deliver? So I then worked for News Corporation, had a large retail portfolio, and I was amazed that people were going online, spending $250,000 on their first website, and uh, then go free shipping and hope for the best. And you know, I just saw that how the, the physical experience and the customer expectation was so linked intrinsically to the sale and to the profitability. And without the ability to match that and predict that, there was so much lost revenue. And before we get into some detail, I'd like to ask you all a question. I'd like you to raise your hand if you bought something online and, and leave your hand up. Now leave it up. Now, I want you to put your hand down if you've ever got to the checkout and have not completed the sale because of either high cost of shipping or you didn't get the delivery options you want. Please notice that everyone in the room just put their hand down. And that's the problem we solve, and that's the problem we're here to t tell you how to solve it with your businesses today. So, I'm here with also Harvey Norman. Um, so Harvey Norman is one of Magento's largest global clients by revenue. And in fact, they're probably one of the, they actually launched their business online with Ship From Store. 
and uh, Gary's going to tell you all about uh, some of the challenges that, um, that they've gone through and some of the things we've done together to solve some of these problems. So my name's Gary Wheelhouse. Uh, I work for uh, Harvey Norman. Harvey Norman is uh, one of Australia's biggest retailers. We're uh, in excess of a $4.3 billion retailer uh, in Australia. Um, I think what's really important about our presentation is I'm a retailer, so I've been in retail all my life, and I think the problems that we're trying to solve with this massive change and this you know, digitisation of, uh, of retail and how to get product to customers and, and give them the things that they love is going to be solved by retailers. We're going to get a lot of help from people along the way, but in the end, Carl and I, our backgrounds are, are retailers. I am the, um, recently the Chief Digital Officer at Harvey Norman, but I was a franchisee uh, within our organisation for 20 years. Uh, I could, we could have a whole other um, presentation about what it's like to, be a, to become a chief digital officer in a retail, you know, um, how you don't get chill, uh, killed by the, uh, the CIO and, and a whole bunch of other stories about um, that. But uh, as I said, I think our journey is an interesting one uh, for you and hopefully I can show you that uh, with Carl's help today uh, and we can give you some understanding of what our journey has been and give you some tips about what you can do in your business. So where are we now? We're at a point of convergence, and we're at this intersection between the online and the offline. And I'll, I'll tell you a story. On the way flying to this conference, uh, Virgin managed to burn a hole in my bag, my, my baggage that, uh, that was on, on stowed away on the plane. And I don't know how they did it, but uh, they did it good. And so I naturally, what do I do? I go, I've got to get a new bag after being offered a, a credit from people at Virgin. Um, and you know, so I pull out my phone, and I type, start typing in baggage brands. So obviously going to try and replace what I had. And as I start going through, you know, there's no local options coming up. Then I start to go to some of the retailers and the department stores that I know. And I was surprised that not a single retailer in Las Vegas with lug selling luggage could give me the option to get it delivered same day, which I, I obviously need a bag right now, or even offer me click and collect, because a lot of them didn't even tell me that they had it in stock. Um, this frustrated me. In fact, the only delivery option I was offered as the consumer was four to five days, and by then I have to leave Las Vegas. So the point of telling you this story is people now are expecting different experiences. The first wave of online retail was all about free shipping, it was all about free, free, price, price, but value can be created in so many ways. It can, it's, and fundamentally, it's trying to about solving these problems about matching the, the, what the customer wants, and from a, t a shipping perspective, with the different types of uh, ship um, options that they can do. When we look at this from a data perspective, of course we all know online sales are growing. But the interesting trend that's also there is the percentage of, web, of um, retail sales that are web-influenced is also growing. So you know, in the early days of retail, um, you know, there was the online team and the offline team. And I remember buying things as a consumer, trying to return it to a store only to be told I couldn't return it to a store, which made no sense, because my interaction as the customer is with the brand. So, you know, I've, of course, retailers have started to get you know, better and better. And if you look at some of the best practice examples here in the US, and specifically in the UK, and there's some, some great um, examples there with people like John Lewis and Marks and Spencer, um, you know, there's, it's just so intertwined. And you need to get this right, because if you don't be, give the customer what they want, um, ultimately, they shop elsewhere. And when we think about the trends that are happening from a shipping perspective, it's all about cheaper, better, faster. So, you know, if you look at in here in the US, day one, you know, three days, two days, one day, and it's just getting quicker and quicker. And why you should care is Amazon, because there's a reason Amazon is building fulfillment centers near every single major US center. Because um, they have a lot of data, and if you look at some of the case studies that have been published with um, Amazon Prime, you know, there's such a correlation between the average sale and the speed of delivery. And in fact, um, in Australia, we've got some um, fashion merchants that offer same-day shipping of apparel. And on a Friday afternoon, their average sales go up 200 to 300%, because people buy a whole, outf um, a whole outfit. And if they offer free returns as well, sometimes they might get two or three different pairs of shoes and return the ones they don't want that afternoon. But again, the extra sales there, the, the difference in cost for shipping, particularly if you're doing a ship from store model, is minimal. Um, often you can do a flat rate box within, uh, the, for the same cost. So you, if you can encourage people to buy more with you, um, you know, it's a quick way to make more revenue. And um, Gary's also got some insights on Amazon as well. 
Well, you know, I, I look at that and what I find really interesting about that slide is that there's an Amazon Kindle point of sale, you know. I, I, I'd like to know what retailer would ever think that having uh, um, Amazon be in control of your point of sale system makes sense, you know. I mean, what do we do next, you know, invite Darth Vader for dinner or something? <laughs> um, so I think, you know, I think what's really interesting for, um, you know, for, for me is that, oh, and, and also for you today, is understanding what our journey has been. We're a very unique model, um, and, and I don't uh, expect for one minute that you would want to um, replicate the model that we, um, that we have, but I think the uniqueness of our model has meant that we've had to do some things quite early um, through necessity uh, that you uh, and, uh, and retailers like yourselves are struggling with um, today. So, you know, to give you a quick understanding of, uh, of who we are, um, as I said to you before, we're a pretty big retailer in Australia. We focus very much, uh, our primary business is consumer electronics, appliances and furniture. So think about um, uh, the majority of things uh, for, your, um, for your home. And we've been around as a, as a traditional, traditional retailer for about 30 years. Um, where our level of complexity comes in, and you'll see that we, we do have stores uh, in different parts of the world, but if we focus on Australia um, today, we have about 180 different locations um, in Australia, which is really great because we're putting stores, and we have stores close to where our customers are. Um, but one of the challenges for us is we are a franchise model, and the, the next level of complexity in that is each one of those locations has multiple franchises. So some of those locations can have four or five different franchisees in that um, location. So if you think about it, we, are, uh, we have uh, two customers, franchisees are our customers, and then we have the, uh, the consumers. So you know, a great challenge for us has been uh, how do we make sure that we utilize our stores because customers love stores? How do we leverage the stores and the power of our stores in this whole new era of online? Uh, and then how do we get 600 franchisees to say, yeah, shipping from stores and uh, being online makes a whole lot of sense. Traditional franchisees, you know, very much reluctant to change. And, and I guess part of this story is, uh, from my perspective, is because I was a franchisee for 20 years, I speak that language. Um, and I always like to point out that I think in a lot of organisations, there's always somebody there, maybe not the person who's going to run online, but certainly somebody there who has that experience as a retailer. And I guess that's, that's what I'm keen to, uh, uh, to point out. We did start off, as you would expect, very much the online sceptic. So we were very much on uh, record from our chairman down as saying that, uh, uh, that uh, you know, as a business, we weren't con convinced that, uh, that online was for us, you know, as crazy as that might um, sound. So, uh, you know, we moved, I guess, uh, quite recently where I would say that we, um, we were very much a late adopter to um, online, but I think having moved into that pragmatist um, position, I think where we're certainly being seen now as a little bit visionary is just, I guess, or a bit of a combination of the fact that when, when you talk it down and then you do something that's pretty good, um, people think you're visionary, you know. <laughs> How crazy is that? But I think also because of our model, it has meant that we've had to do uh, a, a lot of things like ship to store, like click and collect, or you, call, you guys call it order online, pick buy up Buy online, pick up and store. Which is B-I-O-P-U-S-L. <laughs> I don't know what that is, but I think click and collect uh, uh, works for us um, in Australia. So, so we had to do that by, by necessity. So I think in showing you how we've done that, hopefully that will, uh, will open up some um, ideas for you. But, but just think about the challenges for us. Multiple locations across Australia with multiple franchisees. Um, legacy infrastructure, um, you know, we needed visibility of the, uh, um, of the, uh, the inventory. Uh, we don't have and, and have not had and, and don't uh, plan to have in the future centralised distribution. So all of that inventory and the co control of that inventory sits with individual franchisees. Yet customers see you uh, online as one brand and one entity. So, you know, leveraging the power of the brand uh, against the, you know, having a local store and a local franchisee has been a challenge. Uh, a fragmented shipping process, you'd expect that, right? Because you've got franchisees. Franchisees, by their nature, have always got a better idea and a better way of doing it. So, how do you get everybody on the same page? 
Um, the same with uh, shipping capabilities. You know, some stores would do it extremely well. You know, some would throw it on the back of a, uh, of a truck and, and, you know, get it out there in the afternoon. Um, lack of inventory visibility. How would you run a website without telling your customers that you've got inventory? Especially if you, all of your inventory is in those stores. So a huge challenge for us has been, and, and, and you know, I guess that's where we're, we're big fans of Magento because we've been able to do that with Magento. And I don't know, uh, I don't believe that we'd have been able to do that with anybody else. So, um, you know, hats off to Magento because that, that did make it easy for, uh, for us to do that. Um, and then obviously lack of cost um, efficiency because once again, franchisees across all stores will do it in, you know, a multiple of different ways. So if you do ship from store right, two things happen. One, your customers have a better experience and you make more money. And two, your shipping costs go down and you reduce your costs, which is a very good thing for you to do as a retailer. Now, in thinking about the customer experience, it's about matching this. And what stores, as a competitive advantage, allow you to do is offer a whole bunch of alternatives to the vanilla delivered to your home. So um, one of the things Harvey Norman does is click and reserve. So someone that they, think they might be interested to buy the TV, but they might still want to pay for it in store or have a bit more of a chat to see if it is the right thing. And um, that's been a unique thing which they've done. Um, In-store pickups, um, shipping from store, quicker options. And again, one of the byproducts of, uh, of offering more options online is it also helps with in-store conversions. And you know, I noticed with a lot of our customers when it was um, in the GFC that they started to run their inventory very low uh, at a store level. And um, what started to happen is their bricks and mortar sales started to suffer as well. And the other thing I've noticed is as customers are holding more inventory uh, in their stores to support the ship from store model, funnily enough, the bricks and mortar sales start to go up as well because you start to have more SKUs in stock. So, you know, the, the left hand's helping the right hand and uh, there's just a great commercial outcome for both sides of the, of the business. And if you think about this from a Magento context, um, you know, one of the reasons we invested very heavily into Magento was one was the market share of merchants going on it but the flexibility to get under the hood as a solution partner and actually build the solutions. But I remember seeing how wonderful it was for marketing day one, and my questions you know, were coming from a fulfillment background, saying, okay, but what about inventory at multiple locations? And what about address validation? And I can't even print a shipping label out of the box. So as we've evolved our offering in working in collaboration with retailers, we've tried to add all the bits um, that were missing. So you know, we've changed Magento's architecture to support inventory down to a store level, uh, you know, pick slips at a store level. Uh, we built something with uh, Toys R Us called uh, spatial mapping. So we can actually predict at the checkout how to pack the box. So by the time the order goes down to the store, uh, you know, it says take SKU A, SKU B, put it in box B, and then put, that'll go with carrier A, and that's the cheapest, bestest way to do it. So if you think about from a change management perspective, one of the, the most difficult things in implementing this program is, you know, how do you make the cultural change in the stores? Because often the people you have working in your stores, they may have never even sh um, shipped a box before. Um, and, you know, before you get that, how do you get this view of the inventory? So, of course, uh, changing Magento to have that view of the real-time view of the inventory, that's sort of your foundation. And then having, you know, st streamlined processes where all the store has to do is log on to the back of it, print the shipping label, and it takes out all the human elements of thinking. This is what overcomes all the barriers in doing this process. And, you know, one of the byproducts and, you know, I think one of the reasons Australia was particularly quick to get to ship from store uh, is because you've got something the size of the continental US, but with only 20 million people. So, you know, the cost to get something from one side of the country to the other is, uh, is incredibly expensive. So as you start to fulfill locally, the cost comes down. But the interesting thing is, as we expanded our business globally, the same thing happens here in the US, and the same thing happens also in the UK. So when we think about this from an outcome perspective, you know, imagine you've got a store in San Francisco, and you want to send it half a mile down the road. If you booked it on an express uh, service with one of your incumbent carriers, they would literally pick it up, fly it to SFO, fly it to Atlanta, sort it, and then f deliver it back the next day. For a, and that's a real price I got from their website, by the way. Uh, not mentioning any names, but you know, and like Bob said in the intro, um, you know, if something a system like ours is deployed and we have that real-time visibility that hey, there's a bike courier available. I mean, imagine doing a delivery for five dollars. I mean. This isn't just a little bit cheaper. It's not just 5%, 10%. This is game-changingly cheaper. So all of a sudden, not only can you do a cheaper shipping price, which funnily enough, the lower the shipping price, the higher the conversions, but you could even say, you know what, spend $200 with me, and I'll give you free same-day shipping. 
And another part of, uh, of our um, platform is we built what we call the rule engine. So you can set rules down to a SKU level or a zip code level. So imagine being able to curate the delivery experience and say, you know what, the FedEx driver for this zip code is always rude. I'm not going to use them for that zip code. So you're getting down to this absolute point of granularity. Or imagine, you know, same day delivery. Uh, your courier might say, I can deliver anywhere in the Bay Area for three hours. But all of a sudden, if it's Friday afternoon and the 101 becomes a car park and that three hours becomes four hours, they will go on Facebook and express their extreme dis dis dissatisfaction. And these are the moments you need to avoid. And because what um, delivery is all about is keeping promises. Because as soon as you don't keep a promise to your customer, they are unforgiving. You know, so I think anybody who's ever been in a revolution and thought it was an evolution has inevitably been, you know, killed and run over. Um, you know, I think for us, we have no doubt that what we're going through is a real um, revolution. Uh, you know, customers shopping online, there is zero friction for them. Uh, you know, we need to make sure that we take the friction out of what we do uh, with customers. The vast majority of our, uh, the orders that we do um, online are uh, obviously um, fulfilled by stores and uh, uh, generally speaking are picked up um, in stores. So you know our ability to be able to uh, get in there and really focus on the change management and understand that that we really had to change the, the franchisees and the staff mentality in, uh, in stores to make sure that customers had a great experience uh, was, was part of the challenge. Um, and I, we like to think about it as, for our customers as you know, humans when they need them and technology when they don't. Um, and there's a couple of things that I'll pluck out of this, um, this diagram that really focuses um, on that. So, um, you know, uh, the, the, the physical store uh, for us is about giving customers uh, in store the things that they love about um, online. So trying, as I said before, trying to remove that friction, trying to make sure that when a customer goes onto the, onto the website uh, and looks at their local store and checks their local store for stock and we have a real focus um, on stores, you know, we're very, very clear about the fact that the majority of what we develop, and we develop mostly um, in-house because we are quite um, bespoke and we are really integrating with, uh, with legacy systems, as I know a lot of retailers are. If you've been around for you know, 20 or 30 years, you've probably got a point of sale system that's 15 years old that you're really scared of touching. So, you know, making sure that we integrate with um, those systems, we have to to give those customers a great um, experience. And at the same time, we're giving our customers online the sort of things that they love about stores. So you'll see things for us like, um, like live chat is really, really important. We're developing primarily to, um, to get sales online, but if that drives customers into store, that's really our goal because we have a really big investment in our real estate. We've put our stores where we think customers are. Just because Amazon has come along, it hasn't meant that our customers have moved further away from retail stores. That hasn't changed, right? So we've got to leverage the things that are a huge advantage to us as a physical retailer. And online allows us to leverage the local store. Um, and you know, and I, I think to myself, nobody other than us can really get a, a camera to a customer in a regional store in Australia this afternoon. You know, we can because we are close to where our customers are with inventory. So exposing that is really important. And then working with Carl and his team to really make sure that we have that flexibility to scale through both our own technology and through um, Tomando. So making sure that, um, that we have systems in place that, um, and my team are here and have done a really great job in making sure that, uh, that our systems can really be smart about shipping from stores close to where the customers are. Because obviously, um, you know, a lot, I think a lot of uh, the expectation on brick and mortar retailers is that we won't get it there as quick as a uh, pure play. I mean, that's just rubbish. We should be able to get it there quicker. I mean, we're close to where that customer is. Now, there's some real challenges, right? Because 
the franchisees control their, um, their inventory. Uh, you know, we need to expose that to the, the customer. Uh, you, you know, in a lot of cases, not a lot of cases, but in some cases, that inventory that you think is available in store is walking around underneath a customer's arm. So how do you manage that, right? How do you make sure that the stores now put systems in place that when they hold goods for customers, they've got to have a system now that says to, uh, to us, hey, we don't have that inventory. So there's huge challenges around that. Uh, we very much have a mobile first um, philosophy. Uh, we launched our, our M site very quickly after we launched um, online, I think probably less than about six months. We get about 30% of our traffic to mobile. It doesn't necessarily convert um, uh, as well as we would like at the moment, but we'll have a responsive site in the next couple of weeks. But what is really important is that ability to geolocate um, where you are, see the inventory close to where you are, and if that gets you then to purchase online or go into store, then that's great. The only challenge we ever have, the biggest challenge for me in my own business is just working on that attribution model, just convincing the business that they need to continue to invest into the um, to online and the team and growing that business because we don't always get that sale. You know, it's very easy for a customer to locate themselves, see they've got that inventory, and then you know jump in their car and go down to a store. That's a win for us. And and you know, to me, being an omni-channel retailer means that you have to accept that that happens. And by the time, you know, the attribution, we've got a good idea of what our attribution model is. Um, you know, a lot of it we have to, you know, we have to have a fairly good guess at. But the fact is, I will tell you, by the time that we can measure it really, really accurately, we'll no longer need to. So I'm not caught up on that. Uh, and, you know, as I said, those, those 200 plus um, stores are really about providing a seamless experience to the customer. You know, I think for most um, websites, there is always a bunch of customers, a bunch of uh, retailers behind it going, oh. But, you know, <laughs> trying not to expose that to our customers when we have uh, an online service which is flawless, which is integrated into our point of sale system, which will get an order down to a store within three minutes, uh, means that, uh, that when, the, when the, the, um, the customer sees that and is exposed to that, we've got to make sure that the salespeople in store are doing a great job because when the humans touch it, that can be a little bit of a challenge. <laughs> um, you know, so, so I think the other thing that's really interesting about that is the byproducts of what happens when you link your, um, your e-commerce management system into your point of sale system. Uh, we start to see customers now who self-checkout in store. We haven't designed self-checkout, they've created their own self-checkout simply because, uh, and, and in some cases, they're not getting served quick enough. So they go, well, hang on, in theory, I'm in a store, I've located it, the product's right in front of me, I'll just choose this store for click and collect. They just walk up to the cashier and say, is it all right if I walk out the front door? Um, <laughs> So that's making really interesting for us and thinking about what's, what's next for us. Um, we've done a lot of work. Uh, I came back from, uh, uh, from NRF uh, in, uh, uh, earlier this year, and one of the things that I walked away with, which you know, sometimes you, get, you see something really obvious that you punch yourself in the face and say, why didn't I do this sooner, is uh, we're really focused now on doing our customer journey mapping. We found some really good templates to, um, to do that. Uh, I can tell you that when you walk into a, a, uh, a board meeting and say, hey, I think we need to do this because of X, it's not anywhere near as powerful as rolling that big sheet of paper down the middle of the boardroom table with pictures of customers' faces on there saying, these are the friction points, these are the pain points, these are the exit points, this is where you lose your customers. We were trying to do a lot of work and development around fixing lots of different journeys. Now we're really focused focused on making sure that we fix that journey end to end. Um, and when you look at this diagram here and you see that very early on in the piece we were sending emails down to, uh, down to stores, down to franchisees with here's an online order. Um, you know, that for us very clearly wasn't going to work long term. Franchisees move around, right? So um, making sure that we integrated into the point of sale system meant that you know, routing that order to store and getting that information to the store meant that in a lot of cases those, those orders would ship, uh, you know, with, with Carl's um, uh, help, those orders would ship same day, so we'd get it there next day. So it was a real surprise and delight for, um, for customers. 
And there's some really good examples of, uh, you know, um, of what we see socially. And we use, you know, if I go back to the journey mapping, a lot of solving those customer journeys are about finding the opposite of that, right? It's seeing the negative stuff that says, this is where you failed. And when you see that, turning that into those journey maps and saying, that's where the friction is, fix it. Um, and, and, you know, I think there is some real surprise and delight there. You know, I think... Uh, you know, we don't have to do anything uh, uh, too amazing to get products to customers the same day. Because in a lot of cases, those customers are probably within 15 or 20 minutes of a store. So it's leveraging those stores. I can't overemphasize how important it is to leverage those physical assets and the people in the stores. And, you know, these are some of the results. You know, seeing our traffic as we've improved the site, increased by over 50%. You know, seeing our conversions go up as we've learned from those customer journeys, as we've, as we've done and the team is really, really focused on, uh, on A-B testing. We have a really good um, strategy and we're always testing, testing, testing. We have a real mentality around that, uh, you know, which really helps us when we get uh, people in the business jumping up and down saying, change that button from green to red. You know, we can really, you know, and I'm guilty of it myself, by the way, so, um, but it's, it's a really good discipline to have. And, and revenue continues to, uh, to, to climb. Uh, but as I said, our real focus as well as that revenue is about driving that business to, uh, to stores. And, you know, ultimately, it's not rocket science. It's just giving customers what they want. And probably the two key takeaways today is customers want it and they want it now. So if you can match that experience and, uh, and, and create this, um, this delivery execution, um, you've seen the proof in the pudding when it comes to results. Um, and the other key uh, takeaway is with this convergence, it's all about creating a frictionless customer experience. So as you more think about all the barriers that are in part of the sales process, payment, shipping, the more you can overcome them, the more likely the customer is to give you their money. And ultimately, that's the name of the game. And uh, you know, I think the, the other trend is this uberfication. So you know, just trying to get this absolute trust and this, uh, you know, the ability to understand where things are. And as you would have saw just a few slides ago, you know, what's going through the customer's head when they're, they're checking out is, you know, what's it going to cost me and when am I going to get it? And how can I trust you to get it to me? So as you build this trust, you naturally build loyalty as well.